Welcome this afternoon. Thank you for coming out on this absolutely beautiful day, which I will not remind you is a beautiful day outside, uh, for the second of our Grand Rounds this year. Uh, recall that um, our general theme is innovation, which our speaker will speak to. But the other thing I want to remind you of is that uh, as we come into the new world of the Affordable Care Act, that I've now been told is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It's actually got a longer name, much longer than Obamacare. Um, <laughs> that it's ironic uh, that it's Health Literacy Month because that's what we're facing right now is getting a, a whole society to be literate about a new kind of health care. Uh, and I think that we, we ourselves, I mean, I wouldn't want to give a quiz right now about do you know the answer to this or do you know the answer to that? And I bet we probably, except for the fact that all you young people will be able to stay in your parents' health insurance. We all know that one. Uh, but do you know all the other little intricacies? Probably not. Um, but today, we are very honored to have um, an, our second speaker this uh, time. And I'm not introducing him. But I've had the pleasure at uh, lunch to meet him. And he's got lots of good ideas and lots of in interesting things. And he fits with our innovation. So um, I'll just let, turn it over to the uh, Horowitz Professor of Health Literacy, uh, Dr. Linda Aldora. Thank you, and welcome everybody, and um, I just want to say again that this uh, speaker is in honor of the um, October's Health Literacy Month, and the Center for Health Literacy is so pleased to have Scott Ratson, international and national leader in health literacy and health communication, for to kick off the month. And um, I... Uh, we're probably going to say this again later, but I just want to remind everybody that we're actually going to have a, an informal reception after speaking today. So if for some reason we run out of time for questions and answers, the reception is a great place to ask your questions. And there will also be a table at the reception for more information about the Center for Health Literacy and Health Literacy Month and other ways you might want to get involved. But for now, we're here to listen to Dr. Scott Ratson who has made major contributions to improve public health domestically and internationally. In his current role, he's charged with advancing public health policy through communication, health diplomacy, and innovative programs to improve lives. He has actually co-authored the definition of health literacy that serves as the basis for U.S. efforts and has pioneered innovation in mobile health, including the invention of the digital health score, a single health literacy metric for non-communicable disease prevention and care. Dr. Ratson is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Health Communication, International Perspectives, really the leading scholarly journal in health communication. And he's also co-chair of the United Nations Secretary General's Every Woman, Every Child Innovations Working Group, and a member of IOM's Roundtable on Health Literacy. This year, Dr. Ratson was appointed Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Anheuser-Busch InBev, Previously, he was Vice President of Global Health at Johnson & Johnson, Senior Technical Advisor in the Bureau of Global Health at the USAID, Executive Director of Health Communication Technology and Innovation at the Academy for Educational Development, and Founder and Director of the Emerson Tufts Program in Health Communication. And I'm pleased to say we actually have the other co-founder of that program right here from Tufts, Jim Hyde. And he made, Dr. Ratson maintains faculty appointments at Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health, and Tufts School of Medicine, as well as the George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services. And that was the short version of his honors and experiences. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ratson with us today here. So, um... Good afternoon, and thank you, Linda, for the great introduction and a little bit of my background, and I'll be happy to talk a lot more about some of the other things. And I really want to thank Dean Clark for not only putting the education and in a bit of series on, but really the, the warm lunch and, and big ideas uh, that we have for not only what this, shall I say, young school of public health is doing, but yet what this school will be leaving in terms of a legacy with all of you and the innovations that I hope all of you are engaging in. So I've put together a whole variety of slides here. Uh, it goes a little bit through a journey of what I'm now calling as we advance from health literacy and health communication to smarter choices. And it's a, it's a journey and an activity where I think we can help make impact 
to make for a better world with health and well-being. Now, as Linda said in the outset, I've been in four different sectors. I first came uh, after I graduated medical school, and I call myself a public health physician, even though I really don't have an MPH. Uh, my degree is in, in government from the Kennedy School, but I learned a lot from other people who work in, work in public health, and I like to say I'm engaged almost every day in some way or another in public health, and, and working with Jim Hyde in the early part of my career after finishing uh, medical school and uh, another degree in communication, uh, we put together a program in health communication at Emerson and Tufts, which became one of the, which well, was the first program, which was a joint master's program, and it was about that time when I actually started the Journal of Health Communication. Now it's in its 19th year. Uh, after I left academia, I really wanted to do, uh, I didn't ever really leave, I just le left the official place of where I was each day. Uh, I started doing work on HIV, a uh, book on health communication and HIV, something on the mad cow crisis on risk communication and how that was communicated to the public or not communicated to the public very well, and subsequently moved from Massachusetts uh, here to Washington where then, after working at a not-for-profit AED, went to the U.S. government, which I found, for those of you who love government, I do think government can do really good things, and I'm very happy, <laughs> very happy about my time at USAID, where we put an architecture in place that is still engaged in terms of health communication, but there's lots of other piece, things and activities that that large agency does around the world. And then I actually, in the midst of working, and I, I say this because it's a journey, because you never know where your education will take you, but you know hopefully that the foundations and the ethical elements, which should be a harbinger of everything that you do will stay with you wherever. I went to the private sector. And literally, when I went, left USAID on May the 13th, and went to Johnson & Johnson on May the 16th, people wondered, uh, how did you do that? How did you make the transition? And going from a development agency at the Ronald Reagan building in Washington to, I actually moved over to Brussels, it turned out, where I was setting up a European office, but going to a pharmaceutical conference which was all about marketing in a whole different way. It gave you a different perspective. And it also gave a perspective, though, of the potential for what, in this case, private sector and a pharmaceutical company could do. But it was not without the challenges over my 11 years there of actually building an organization in Europe, which then included, believe it or not, J&J, &J, 110,000 people, did not have a position in global health. But I articulated for a position and the need to focus on global health that one, I know we don't like to say this here in the Washington or inside the Beltway, 60% of the, the global health funding, while USAID is the single largest funder, 60% actually comes from other governments outside of the United States, a good part of it in Europe, and then there, of course you have Japan and now you have a whole new development environment. But 60% of that, plus what happens in Brussels and that regulatory environment often impacts globally before things happen at the US FDA or other places as well. So the interconnected world made sense from a business perspective to also see what was happening in Geneva, what was then migrating from WHO, World Health Organization activities in Geneva to the United Nations, and only the second time in history we had the United Nations uh, work on a health issue at the global level. The first time was for HIV, the second time that was 2011 on non-communicable diseases. And I took the role to represent the private sector, in this case, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in terms of the non-communicable diseases, but learned a lot about the other sectors. So, fast forward to the elephant in the room today. I work at Anheuser-Busch in Bethlehem. <laughs> now, this is a company which has global reach. We used to say at Johnson & Johnson, probably one billion people had access to a product in a given day. But they don't think the product, whether it was baby powder, baby shampoo, or rough cosmetics, or maybe in medicine, that it may or may not do anything for public health. We also made some medicines that did help people in tuberculosis and HIV and so forth. So you could say, okay, there's some specific public health medical interventions, but there's other interventions. Well, the company I'm with now probably has over a billion people a day have either access to the product. And I haven't run the numbers, and I like to see the numbers, of the impressions of the people that know something about the different products. Uh, that's whether it's at sports stadiums, whether it's at other commercials, whether it's just through uh, friends or, or neighbors. But what people have said, is that beer is the original social network and it brings people together. <laughs> so I'm looking very seriously, 
Just like, as, as some people say, pharmaceutical companies sell harmful products if they're not used as directed. If you take paracetamol in the UK, uh, or you take acetaminophen, known mostly as Tylenol here in the US, and you take too many, it will kill, kill you. 400 suicides, unintended deaths a year from Tylenol alone in the United States. Other countries uh, have, have done some things around how to limit those kind of things. But here in the United States and globally, we're trying to still look at harm reduction. And what I'm trying to do with my new position, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and this is a long introduction, to say that I really believe that no matter what fields you end up with, and I'm, lo I'm looking at the young people, if I can say, because I'm getting you know, my sixth decade, right? Uh, a little different. Um, your public health piece, and whether it's health locally, locally to friends, family, as, as, as the continued consensus circles go out, what you do and what you say can continue to make a difference. And I'm trying to practice public health from a new venue. And we'll see some of these ideas I'll share with you today. None of them are meant to be branded. All of them are meant to be challenged. And all of them hopefully are meant to be ideas that hopefully we can all do together. Because I think that's really the, the harbinger of what makes success in not only government, as we heard a hand before, but also in the public health field. We cannot do this alone. So I'm going to go through some stuff in this kind of way of what is health, health communication, and so forth. Talk a little bit about communication strategies. The new frontier, which of course has been health literacy that we know today, and we've heard, and I commend the Hor Horwitz and the Horwitz professor uh, to be able to be engaged in health literacy. I'm a big believer that it'll make a huge difference for generations, and as uh, you'll see later, I have a plenty of evidence to support that as well. And what is the next frontier? Do we continue to have to have frontiers? And hence, I guess we use the word innovation in the series, so we need to have some innovation in that regard. Uh, not meant to be a, a formal lecture, but I do like the Institute of Medicine definition of health. It reminds us of the social uh, reality of health, what we do as a society collectively to ensure the conditions where people can be healthy. Also, the preamble of the Constitution of the WHO, there are lots of other quotes we can use, and I've been using the word to move more from health as absence of disease, which we don't use, to health as well-being. And what does well-being mean? That's still another, uh, another challenge. So this was a model that maybe you've seen, the Evans and Stoddard, is sometimes called the field model. And Jim and I use this as the basis of at least the thinking and the thoughts when we put the health communication master's program together. But I like to show this. It, I speak to a lot of medical, or have spoken to a lot of medical audiences. And so much of where you go to the medical folks is they always want to live in the healthcare system. That's what they do. That's where the docs, the nurses, where they know they drive, they wear their white coats, or do whatever. But we know here in public health, most of our work is really up here. And this is the reality of what affects health and well-being. So I always try to move us away from <coughs> the tertiary health care, recovery, disability, and death up. And still, though, a lot of the, the quality measures a lot of the activities of how medicine is delivered in America tend to be in this part. So I, I think it's just important, and you'll continue to hear, this is you know, before the Michael Marmot study and all the other pieces, but very, very important. And this is the basis of a, um, a little monograph that I did on global health challenges for the 21st century. I think it was about 15 years ago now. But the, the model hasn't changed. I mean, you might argue which ones the boxes are in the right sizes or so forth. But I also commend uh, you here for the, 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 the emphasis in family, the emphasis in the, the community environment. And I would say that a lot of the health literacy stuff is, is, is not just in the education piece, but as we now know, is in all of these different areas. This is just another slide that, that reminds us, similarly, the access to medical care and the medical care itself is only 20% of, of, of population health. It's so much more of what health is, is the environment, the ecology, the social characteristics, behaviors. and if I were giving a presentation on who's delivering the medical care, it will differ by country, but a lot of it is also done by private sector. So it also starts to talk about the private-public relationship, how much we can influence the system, but the real part of the system is you know, this part, the whole total ecology. This is the bigger piece, the social and societal characteristics, the social norms and other areas that we'll talk a little bit about. So I mentioned the journal just to, to remind people, and I can't tell you, still to this day, as editor, I get challenges. We don't have enough evidence that communication works, or show me the evidence on behavior change. And I can't say that I carry this around at the 10,000 plus pages, uh, and it is all um, 
now luckily online and so forth. But I used to carry around you know, some of these systematic review articles to say, no, here are all the mass media campaigns that have made a difference. And don't use that as a reason why we should invest in somewhere else in public health. This is an area that, that has made its way into a field. And I also you know, commend the efforts here to do that. A lot of people, we were moving toward the end, we wanted to go, not even use the word behavior change. We wanted social change. We wanted to change a generation at a time. So we no longer talk uh, about new items, but they're in, ingrained, such as vaccinations and other areas. Although, you know, we still have challenges, as Professor Quinn has been writing about so well. Now, uh, innovation. I'd love to say that I could come up with 10 ideas and all going to be innovative and all going to work and it'll be 95% certainty and I'll be able to publish all of them. But good innovation, just like if you're playing in a, in a hockey game or a soccer game, right? Everything's not going to go in goal. So we need to try a lot of different things, but it is laborious and the yield's disappointing. And um, America, we have a, an unfettered optimism. That's what I've also learned with my cultural reality. I do my global stuff. I mean, remind people to be optimistic. And I heard today, I was just at the, um, I'm on the RAND Board of Health Advisors, so I learn a little bit still about health systems and a lot, a lot of different areas. But what was interesting that was said by the chair is that when she used to work at a, a company, they, didn't know, they did not only have an innovation reward, they had a failure reward. Because the people that would succeed would actually still fail. And the joke was is that you wanted to make sure you rewarded them early in the failure so you didn't invest a lot along the way. <laughs> but it does remind us that we have to be willing, and I think Americans are in certainly the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, to, do, to be able to do that. But we also have to look at an evidence base, and everything we do should be evidence based. So what, what communication strategies exist uh, and have, have been worked? Well, this is the piece I really don't like when people would say, let's just look at the data, the data speak for themselves. And those of us in health communication know the data don't speak. And Jeff Drazen and others, uh, New England Journal of Medicine editor and others continue to say, the problem is not in the research, but in the way it is interpreted in public. And I think we have to realize that the data can speak for themselves and so much of what we learn is taking that data to a level of understanding. The other thing is, if it measures, it gets done. You've heard that same sort of thing here. Surveillance sets the agenda. We just count how many people are not or are getting something. We've got to be careful about that. And then the indicators set policy objectives. Similarly, we've seen that. Quality medicine is delivered in America because we all have attained that when somebody's discharged from the emergency room with a heart attack, they get a beta blocker. That was a quality measure that's been retired. Well, does that really move quality medicine that much? Maybe it's moved quality in that area for that specific condition. But we have to think about how those indicators are and how far off they are. And then this is the old, the old stuff. Um, I say old, with posters, PSA school programs, and so forth. These are a lot of the tactics that are used. PSAs are public service announcements, or some people like to rename that pro-social advertisements. Uh, but there's, these are things that are used, and they're just tactics. This is another thing that worries me, although people continue to say, oh, I have anecdotal evidence. And those of us evidence folks don't like to say that anecdotes don't make evidence, but perhaps they do show signals, as we often use, of what we should look at. So this is just a, an example of some of the challenges that we face. Now, Rajiv Ramal has done uh, a lot of work on health communication recently. I just like this because it reminds us that every aspect of health and well-being has health communication in it. This has, of course, the, you know, the important model of um, uh, this, the, the whole well-being piece. So we have to look at all of these. They're equal in this piece. They're different to each of us in different cases of our lives. Now, one area that I have found very, very uh, valuable is the fact that a lot of advances in communication and health communication have happened when there have been issues in the world. Not just 9-11, we've talked about H1N1 issues, uh, when there's conflict, and so forth. And a lot of what that's done is it brings people together to solve issues. So part of what I think we need to be doing more of is what I'm now calling the health diplomacy, of bringing people together from different areas. And inside this green circle is in the health diplomacy area. The diplomacy is usually thought of as interaction between state actors. You get together and you negotiate something international health regulations, how you negotiate and deal with uh, a virus or whatever it might be, or uh, infectious diseases, mostly where that's come from. But more and more, is, uh, there's involvement with NGOs and foundations, governments, 
And the private sector has to get involved uh, in many cases because they're the ones that, for, for instance, can ramp up vaccines in other areas. But around this, what it's supposed to be, these are supposed to look like the Millennium Development Goals. So you actually have some of them that are still here, such as reduce child mortality, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education. And the hope was, and this was uh, developed for an innovation working group paper that um, I edited uh, with our group, but we were asking for the idea of having health diplomacy as the next frontier. That when we're looking at Millennium Development Goals, we should have, which you probably can't read here, health literacy, health system strengthening, NCDs, and look at ways of bringing those in to the discussion process. Now, I've been talking about health diplomacy for a while, and there's a, I, I could certainly share the green paper. I think it's online. But we built upon what came out of the European perspective, where seven countries got together in Norway. Uh, they had worked on this. Uh, Anna Lind, the Swedish, uh, she was the Swedish minister who was killed. There was some work on conflict prevention and health as a bridge to peace there. The WHO had been talking about this. But it didn't resonate in the United States. And I've been talking about it for a while. And uh, it wasn't until now, December of last year, where the US State Department renamed the Office of Global Health Initiatives to the Office of Global Health Diplomacy. They have an ambassador there now to start to work on global health diplomacy. And if you look at what it could be, it could be how we engage in public health with multiple actors around the table to help make better decisions. And I say that because it's not the first time diplomacy has been used by HHS or health in, in, at the American level. Tommy Thompson used to talk about it in terms of medical diplomacy. And it was a ship going around to help people you know, with some surgeries and things of that nature. This is true ongoing health diplomacy that's, that helps bring different actors together. And I think the field of public health, and I know the field of public health is looking at this. It's been taught at the Geneva Institute with Alona Kickbush. We've done some of these pieces over at, um, at Columbia at Melman. And there's a lot more interest now in how health diplomacy can be the new public health frontier. Now, at the same time, we have to look at you know demo um, demographics uh, and well, the empty of, of obesity. Uh, and, this is, not, this is just meant to be illustrative. Uh, health literacy now, low now is being linked more with the new technologies and the new communication. But the piece here is, is that, which I think the Institute of Medicine did well in this publication, is to put the consumer first. But all of this is in what I call a dream. Can we really do that top right? Can we bring all of these things together? And I don't only call it a dream, I call it something that's a hard thing to do pie in the sky idea. <laughs> and the pie in the sky idea, where I'm really helpful is, is the next new frontier. That the pie in the sky idea is taking health literacy, and this is just a short action guide, taking the evidence base that we have in communication, bringing it to the global level, and having the pie in the sky again. Now when I gave a presentation like this, I could put a whole slew of different logos. I've used this pie in the sky in health literacy in Beijing, and Brussels, and Geneva, and Moscow, all places. It usually translates to the Germans don't know why a cake is doing in the sky. <laughs> but there are, there's this same saying, if anybody's from China, there's a proverb, there's all these other pieces. So it's a big idea, something that we can aspire to, but something that's dreamlike. And I think health literacy kind of fits there. So I came up with this definition of health literacy, working with Ruth Parker in the year 2000. And it was a time when I was transitioning from Tufts to AED, and we did the current bibliography of medicine. And through the National Library of Medicine librarians, we looked at every article that had ever been published that had something related to health and literacy, and a bunch of exclusion criteria, and we tried to put it in a certain, uh, certain framework. And it's, that's published, and we updated it a few years later. But we came up with this definition, and I, and I want to say the definition because it's really important that the US has adopted this, and it, it is maybe quite American, but there's some key words here that we really fought for. Um, we fought for something that a lot of people don't understand that we are taking it beyond health education to understand basic health information and services. All of a sudden, the service delivery was, what does health literacy have to do with the service delivery? And we also brought up the word appropriate health decision, that people could be educated, they can know everything possible about smoking and the dangers of tobacco, but we had to still help them make the appropriate health decision at that time and place. So nowadays, though, it's advanced. We have the ability to obtain information, interpret the information, understand the information, and appropriate health decision making. And you know the lecture of this title is to take it to another level. It's decision making, but it's also helping make these smarter, informed, um, sound choices. 
This is the model that Ruth Parker put forward, which I like, and I'll come back to it at the end, because it reminds us that this is not just health education, which is the left, which is a lot of where it had been, if I can say, without disparaging anyone's particularly. Health education, health promotion early, days with more on the left side. And what Ruth has been trying to work on is more on the right side. And still, to this day, we're not necessarily there, but we're trying to come with the green light of what it is, and the research is helping us. Now, I mentioned the global piece and why I'm such a believer in it, and I shouldn't, I think the first is the most compelling piece, which is in all, almost every now global document that I can help, to remind people that 175 countries, between 1970 and 2009, more than half the reductions in child deaths are gained in women's educational attainment. So people ask, what are the real public health innovations of the last century? Three of them. Antibiotics and the use thereof, right? Vaccines and elimination of, of polio, at least from the Americas and smallpox and so forth. And the third is women's education. And we're still, where are we on that S-shaped curve on women's education? We're not where we could be. Uh, so I'm still very much a believer. Now, I, I put this here at the same time. This is not all health literacy, but it shows the education itself. And then you have know, you know, the... the uh, economic empowerment, and a lot of other pieces that need to be put in place here, but it is so important. Similarly, the, on the entire community's well-being, and um, UNFPA is now using the girls' education, and you'll see some of it in the microfinancing work by the UN agencies there. Uh, another piece that I've worked on is how do we keep people more informed and engaged. So this is the WHO preamble, and I thought one thing that's been very important to help get health literacy down to other global documents has been a ministerial declaration. Stressing that health literacy is an important factor in culture development of appropriate action plans to promote health literacy. The U.S. has a national action plan. China has a national action plan. And if anybody likes to look at indicators, China has 66 indicators of health literacy. Why 66? Because it's a lucky number. And, and that catches on and people know what they are. But a lot of it's health and hygiene and pieces that, that you might not see as health literacy. But the point here is that they have taken it on seriously and they're not afraid to publish change against those indicators. So much that they say 9% of their population is health literate. So they have an upside, but they're still doing it. Now, it's nice that we say Affordable Care Act, week one of Affordable Care Act. Uh, we do know that you know this is part of it, and this has been said, that people have the right to make informed decisions. And I, I don't have the actual quote that's in the, the act, because it just basically has a definition that says that the program should put this in place. But this is what Secretary Sevilla said in the press release. Health literacy is needed to make health reform a reality. Without health information that makes sense to them, people cannot access cost-effective, safe, and high-quality health services. So again, here's the direct link on the information and services. And it's up to all of us now. How do we help do that, show that, have it uh, make a difference? And what do we do to help to enable health literacy citizens? Now, I've been a believer in trying to come up with innovation. And I like to just say, if you give people the 10 things to do, we would do them. Or even, I'm also a believer now in checklists. But I think checklists that we use in other parts of life, we should use in general health care. We don't use that, basically. We don't have a consumer-facing checklist. I think I talked about that in q and Because one of the reports that we did for our innovation working group was on checklists. And October one day, we wrote the checklist manifesto. And Jonathan Spector at Harvard, we wrote this piece together. And at least when we scaled, we couldn't find anything on checklists. Uh, with, except there's a safe surgical checklist, and there's a safe childbirth checklist, and there's stuff used by health providers. But on the consumer side, there's nothing. And at the same time, there was an op-ed in, in the last year, the same, on uh, how Johnny Cash used checklists, that Zico Manuel wrote about checklists and how it's an important innovation. And Richard Horton and the Lancet called for frugal innovation, such as checklists, <laughs> as promising things. So I think that there's opportunities in some of these areas. This was one area that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and it came to me as a... Um, would I come to a meeting held in Washington where we had um, Office of Women's Health, I was actually with the Commonwealth of Virginia, a group called Voxiva, um, we held it with the GW, and they said, could we do something on text messages for women's health? And it seemed like so-called a neat idea. I like the idea we even use a flip phone. People say, who uses those anymore? <laughs> That's only four years ago. Um, and it is rudimentary. It is, it is text 101, 140 characters, what do we do? We had the CDC there, and the CDC actually helped with the messages. We tried to bring Johnson & Johnson to make them more consumer-friendly messages. 
there's always a big fight between a federal agency when you have to put in urinate, you can't ask a woman did she pee. Mm -hmm. yes, so a lot of back and forth, despite the fact that the focus groups and consumer testing said you need to communicate clearly. Anyway, at the end of the day, it's in English and Spanish. Uh, I know you have people working on text for baby evaluation and know better than me about what's happening. But I think what was most interesting, and it's unbranded, I could talk to you all of you like about the branding and who had to print the posters and the challenges of working with the federal government. Um, but this is what happened, which was really cool. All the different federal agencies, or many different federal agencies, came on. And I think the Department of Defense is actually doing one of the first evaluations we haven't seen yet. Um, or I haven't seen yet. Um, 50 states, everybody signed on in the end. And it went all the way down to like New York City and birth certificates were put on the outside of the mailing. You know, check text for baby now for info about your immunizations for your kids. So it caught on a lot, but I hate, I hate to say, this is not the number that we hoped for. We had a larger number. And the lesson I've been telling people from this, and we fought for this, and J&J, and &J, we had to put a certain amount of money in, and we had to triple that amount of money. And it didn't go into the project itself. It went into promotion and project management. But we needed to have, I, there are slides of all these partners. They put up billboards. They did posters. You still needed mass media reach. You still needed a, an advertisement that would go at the right time of day at the right piece. So, Good ideas can happen. I do think this is a good idea, and I do think it has great potential. But it's, it's 101. And we, we then were asked, which I think is a good positive thing, on a quasi-health diplomacy. Vice President Biden went over with Dr. Joe Biden to Russia, and they wanted to bring something that would say how the U.S. is offering some innovation. And this was the innovation that he mentioned in his speech. And we have text for baby that we had to fund. They were asked J&J asked &J to fund it at that time because you couldn't, couldn't do it through the regular mechanism. So it was another sort of public-private partnership. But it has potential, and I think that I haven't seen any of the Russian data yet, but the design was already learning from the U.S., and hopefully vice versa, these kind of things would happen. It also went globally into um, just a, sec a, a mobile alliance for maternal action we helped set up. And it was, again, a U.S. State Department, public-private partnership, and that has some other data that we've learned. Now, I mentioned before that there was an interest in non-communicable diseases. Uh, at the UN level. And I had been thinking about non-communicable diseases for a long time. And I gave this lecture at the National Library of Medicine in 2000. And I did learn from the, the late Norman Stearns, who um, was with, uh, the co-founder with me also at Tufts. He said, you know, anytime you try to give some of these presentations, this is before all the... He used to, he used to do this. So you have to film it. You have to tape it. And, but then he also said, you try to publish it. But um, for whatever reason, just like today, the lighter lecture was, was uh, recorded at the, um, at the NLM, and then I also you know, wrote it up and so forth. And I actually talked about this idea of a digitized health record in 2000, what the year might look like, what the world could look like. Just a simple digitized record for the 21st century, six or more factors for health. Simplify it, keep, keep it down. There was a book by Sir Martin Rees called Just Six Numbers. If anybody's an astrophysicist, he was an astrophysicist who wrote about the whole universe could be explained by six numbers. So can't we do the same for health? What are the risk factors? So I thought about this, I worked on it for a while, and then finally, aha, chronic disease. 75% of non-communicable diseases are caused by these risk factors. The new global burden of disease numbers support this, and this is global, and if you drill down in even some countries, it's even more. So I brought some people together. Um, at London School of Medicine Tropical Hygiene, at Columbia, we had some WHO center people in Canada and Germany. And we came up and we, we uh, validated this algorithm and we put it together for something. Okay, can we create what I'm calling like a credit score for your health? I hate that metaphor. I wish there'd be a better one. But like, people know what it means. You know if you get a credit card or you get a loan or what have you. So can we have a single number? Then can we try to get people to understand what that number is? So they don't have to think of my cholesterol, 200, you know, all these different pieces. And I know that total cholesterol is not the best proxy, but it's a proxy. Uh, can we have the given simple goals? Can we have these range of indicators? Can we motivate people? And then can we track it over time? So we did this, and we designed it as a, as a health literacy metric. And um, this is what it looks like. I guess this is an Android, or an Android phone. So it's available free of charge on Android and Apple. I did it in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Portuguese because it was launched the Brazilian Ministry of Health. We had to make it HIPAA compliant where the numbers actually are owned on your device, but the total aggregate score goes up to the cloud. 
we have zip code and gender, and the only thing we control for in the algorithm by the expert is the alcohol use and gender. That women lose points if it's over one drink a day. Uh, men use, lose points if it's over two. Uh, again, it's all evidence-based. And then we just published it this summer in Global Heart. Uh, now, if you build it, they will come. No way. It's just like text for baby, right? I mean, this, what do we do to get this going? Yes, it got, Microsoft did a lot of PR because it was the first one on the Windows 8 platform or whatever platform they were launching uh, at the time. So you can get it different ways, but I'm not sure exactly what this means. And you might argue, well, it doesn't have immunizations, and that's important. Well, we talked about if you're a 50 plus or whatever the, the, the number is that year that we could put an immunization piece. And there's lots of ways, but I'm not showing you, and I don't want to go too much into it, is that we have the what if that, you know, what if I just, and it's supposed to be red, yellow, green. I did, a, there's a variety of other paper versions of this before. Um, but then it's intuitive that if it's yellow, if I, ex if I, what if, if I exercise more, I get 10 points more. If I exercise seven times a week, there's a zero. Um, tobacco, and if it's red, you click here, you get into the National Cancer Institute's quick test now, and if you change your tobacco use, you get 20 points. Tobacco is high, weighted the most, of course, uh, and, and all of these. So we think it's a tool, but we're not sure you can read this or whatever where it could go. But I just wanted to show that as I think that the new technologies are of great potential. And that leads to the final piece, the next frontier I'll talk about maybe for the next 10 minutes or so, and then let's really some time for questions. Um, that this is all going to even go away of, uh, while we have the technologies, we have some people that are still not pleased with technology. And even in this country, there still is a digital divide with access to the internet. That's why I'm also a big believer in mobile phones. Six billion mobile phones, mobile devices. I'm, I guarantee there's more mobile devices in this room than the crisp watches. Uh, we know that there are more mobile devices than toilets and other things, but still, there are some people that aren't reached. So we've got to figure out ways to do that. I believe that if we can figure out a way that health is open, is arm's length of everybody, that would be a great thing to do. And then evidence-based quality health. So these are some of the ideas of uh, the next frontier, the social life of health. Again, I just said 6 billion have phones. 61% of people are looking for health or medical information. That's probably low. If they're not looking for it, they're getting it just by doing a Google search and having the side push materials there. And the urbanization issue is really key. So we do have this access that's changing everybody's lives. And um, we have to figure out what we can do with it. So uh, the post-2015 agenda will explain that Millennium Development Goals were designed with the idea to get the world and the donors of the world to work together to try to eradicate poverty, universal education, and so forth. Uh, those expire in 2015. And some of those we will not have attained, like maternal health. Maternal mobility has gone down, but not gone down enough. Same with, same with children's, uh, preventable children's disease and even death due to pneumonia and so forth. But having said that, new ones are going to come out. And they're actually looking to change the term from Millennium Development to Sustainable Development Goals. So all you environmental health people think that's great. But the people in maternal newborn health don't necessarily think that's great. Or the people that want to have universal health care don't think that's great. So all the health people aren't sure we want one goal. And if we have one goal, what is that goal? So the good thing is, is that healthcare is coming up there. But then you have also, I hear people lobbying over public health issues like road safety, fifth leading cause of death uh, by 2030. But that should be up there. So you've got a lot of discussions going on. And the people-centered care, though, is happening in a positive way. So I think there's some positive things here. I guess at the end of the day is that we're having more people that realize that health is our only common currency. And now how do we raise that? So. I, I want to say this in a positive way because I think that public health field, at least my area of public health, if I say health communication has evolved, where we looked at health education as sort of one way, just give people information and then health was in schools and we have the CHESS, the certified health educators and so forth. And then we introduced health communication, which was more two-way and then multilateral, multi-stakeholder communication. And we did that also with health promotion. And then with health literacy, which also talks about skills and understanding and simplifying the system. But I think there's still something more that we started to hear social marketing, just narrow and you know, those campaigns. It's not really just here. That's 20 years now as well. Now we're starting to hear behavioral economics. You know, just the way we ask people the questions on, on their Medicare Part D, which is the, the, the section in Thaler's book uh, on, on, on behavioral economics and nudge and so forth. It can help people make decisions. Or we just do a little bit different on social psychology that we just move some things in that regard. But if you put all of that together, 
And this is where I think you really need to put all of that together. You can help make a difference. And that's where kind of the idea is, is that is there something that we can do smarter? And I think we can make smarter choices. And that's kind of the idea. Very good at learning and thinking about things. Intelligence or judgment. So being smart is judgment and intelligence. And it's picking or deciding between two or more possibilities a choice. So it's not just smart decision making. It's helping make a smart choice. And what is a smart choice? The individual's there, but we have an environment that's helping make the influence. As we used to say in the social norms in other world, make the healthy choice the easy choice. And we have to make, help people make better decisions. So having a system that has better decisions that you can choose from. The health literacy side of the, of the equation. And as such, I've taken Ruth's piece, and this is the first time I'm showing it. <laughs> so you have to tell me if it's good or bad. Or how it can be fixed. Everything is, that's a good thing about models and theories, right? They're all always being improved upon. But there's a lot more social influence here. There's a lot more of the evidence that we have in social norms in this whole behavioral environment social environment. So if we do that, I think we can end up more on the smarter choice. And the smarter choice could be shorter term, and, you know, same sort of piece that we have with our general, if I could say, you know, health behavior theories, right? With uh, everything from both the early adopters in the diffusion area to how we might be in, in health behavior change. Uh, and this is kind of how I'm just trying to break it down right now. An individual, you're thinking about your well-being. You also should be thinking about others' well-being in terms of the environment. And we were very successful in the public health world on secondhand smoke. And that made the biggest difference. And Jim could probably say more of that. I still believe it was the tipping point. But to make it not just the individual, but the environment around the people that were part of the consequence of tobacco. <coughs> and then the system. You know, how do we get the right resources to make the smart choices? That maybe it's okay to build bicycle paths and not mandate bicycle helmets at the same time. Uh, maybe it's better to think about urban planning with schools of architecture and schools of engineering and schools of public health together and not just the square footage ratios and other pieces that are there. So there's a lot of different ways of doing and helping make the smarter choice. And this is some areas where I think it can be, you know, eat in, in and outside of home uh, safety, uh, getting the use of checklists if you just had some simple pieces there that what you could do in, in safety, helping people make decisions, Smarter choices there, social engagements, uh, all the way up to the use and the choice of um, uh, substance use and so forth. So here's a little piece. You may have to remove your bowel, the bone, your glands, your legs, but is that necessary? Sometimes you want to do nothing, right? Uh, that's another another piece of healthcare, another debate. Um, but how do we make the smarter choice, and how do we empower people to do that? So I don't really know. I looked a little bit at the social norm literature and you know, proud to say that my new, soon to be working with me new as a director, uh, formerly a doctoral student at Columbia, Alison Goldberg, had done her, has done her work on social norms and vaccinations. And I think that there's a lot of one, thinking what we've learned from there, and also social norms and how we approach the public health challenges that people who are buying some of the products of the company that I work for and others need to think about things. So. I'm not going to go into the whole social norm piece other than it's science-based, it's community-based, and it's a way of affecting the audience and the environment in certain groups and so forth. But I know many of you probably know this much better than I do. Um, here's some quick evidence because I have to also address the elephant in the room. I want to try to reduce the harmful use of alcohol. Alcohol is a product that's only supposed to use as directed in the United States. It's only legal for people over the age of 21. But people at universities we know drink not in this university studies, so I'm saying people at universities, people throughout the world drink at different ages. Uh, but the social norm theory and the social norm projects, strategies for generating social norms, have a good response on people understanding about things drinking, that that's not the norm. And these are the reductions that are there. This is from Florida State. They actually have this idea that you can follow this. This is not the way how it works. But I'm using this as an example. And if you're not really sure, you can go to www.alcoholfloridacityfsu.edu um, and how to use the card. But these things inspire me. I didn't show you the cards on the digital health scorecard, but it means, hey, there's enough of a little science that you can simplify it to a nature that you can put on a card. Well, imagine you put the digital piece on it. You add in age. You add in gender. You add in weight. You add in when you ate last. Are you drinking other fluids? And so forth. Then you might be able to at least get people to this. 
then we can think, okay, now what are the consequences? What do you do? So the smart choice is, is you're going out and you're going to get one of these. The smart choice before you even get in one of these red, yellow rings is you have a designated driver. Or you make sure you have the transportation way home. You think through the process. So I use that as an example. There's other pieces that are out there, and I've had people come up to me already from everything from Bowen to a piece. This is one. Alpha Hoot is another one. So somebody that told me today that just we were on the board of a group that won a Gates Challenge grant that has a headset piece about the size of the headset that you would plug in that uh, in preliminary data testing figures has the ambient air on, uh, on if there's tobacco uh, if there's tobacco smoke and whatever else pollutants that are there. But I'm sure the ambient air could also be there for alcohol. It could be there for other areas. I think there's real opportunity in how we can use these new technologies to stop people from doing things that are harmful. And I say that in a positive way because it could still be, uh, in terms of alcohol and driving, it's not, the alcohol was not a problem with people killing other people behind the wheel of a dangerous transportation device until the transportation device came into play. So now we have to figure, that was kind of a disruptive paradigm if you look at this that way, how do we take it to the next level? So here's some stuff that uh, Michigan State's doing on using Facebook, what to do with their students and how they against social norms, and um, this is where I think that smarter choices can go to road safety. I mentioned that it's the fifth leading cause of death. The UN has activities on this. There's a decade of action. Now, World Bank builds transportation systems. Well, gives money for countries to build transportation systems. Is there a public health component on there? Yeah, they do some stuff on road safety, but are they thinking about putting the systems in place? Uh, in different areas. So I'm looking at a lot of these right now in the new area, and I think what we can come up with is uh, evidence-based technology building upon what we have. So we know that seatbelts and airbags work, 67% reduction. We know that you know, a seatbelt alone is not enough, so the airbags, which are passive devices for people, right? And we know that that doesn't work. But we also have seen early that <coughs> alcohol interlocks in the United States, somebody already has uh, driving under the influence, has to blow into a device to see if they they're, don't have alcohol. It will stop the car from starting. Are working, and this was, the, at least in this particular study, was the end point. But you can extrapolate that that end point of limiting repeat offenses is limiting the harm and the risk on the road. So I think that's quite interesting. What the WHO has shown, though, is this is a big public health issue that they're, they're trying to move to uh, different countries. So I think what we could do this is one of my ideas now. We've been doing this with airbags, and we've been doing this with seatbelts. We can probably do something to address the alcohol. Um, and just on the history of it, I was about I was six years old here when the first seatbelts. My dad was a was an OB in Los Angeles, so he actually bought seatbelts that we put in door cars. <laughs> clunky things. We had to wear them because he was a believer that you needed to do this. But the country didn't want it. People fought against it. You're making me do something. And if anybody remembers the early seatbelt stuff, people hated it. They hated the bells and whistles. They, they disabled it. And it wasn't until the law went into place to require people. And the law was not enough. Then you had to enforce the law. Then you had to do a campaign for the law. And we learned from health communication that you have to also remind people to click it or ticket on a nine-month interval or you'll start to see seatbelt use drop off, even with all the evidence that's there. So anyway, I think we've been successful with seatbelts. Airbags, it was the legislation that made it mandatory. This just came out a few weeks ago, and if you've been following any of this, there's cars that will drive themselves in five, 10 years, but we're still gonna have a lot of dangerous vehicles out there. So I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm looking to see, uh, can we come up with some sort of device that limits the, the harm from people drinking and driving? So there's the kind of the final piece. Um, you know, I, I, I think the smart choice paradigm can work. Uh, I'm calling it that. Help me if it doesn't make sense. Rand has is one of their things. We we are about, and I, I just learned this today from, from um, our CEO when he said, our sort of goal and mission is sound choices based on evidence. That's what they claim. It's very, very simple. Of course, they're in the policy environment. But can the smarter choice work? Will it work in a public health environment? Does it also seem like, oh, there's only the, quote, smart people who know better and those of us over here? But we all make choices and make judgments each day. I don't know. I haven't tested all of, all of it yet, and it's just a paradigm and a framework. 
there may be some other pieces that would go under this. But I think the social influence, the policy, all these people together is our, our next kind of evolution. And I think it's all up to all of us to tie into the innovation here of, of how we innovate and, and how we use the multiple disciplines and multiple reach that we have in our daily lives to do that. So that's my hope. I hope to do this under what I now call global well-being um, and hope to advance the public health innovation with smart choices. And you really want to thank all of you and, and commend all of you who are studying in this field. I hope you stay in this field and don't always think that the road's going to be straight. It's not an arithmetic one. I don't know when the slope goes up. Uh, and it may be a zigzag, but if you follow your heart and you want to do the right thing, you, you'll be able to and you'll be able to make a difference. And if even it's one life at a time or multiple things that you can change and then help people whatever way. There's lots of space here in public health. So I really commend um, all the work you're doing. Dean Clark and your whole group here. Um, and again, thanks and congrats to the Center for Health Literacy. I think there's a lot there uh, that we're still only at the tip of the iceberg. Even though we're 20 years into since the, since we've, the field's developed, it takes that amount of time. So here's my email. You can always find me there. I don't really, I should say I, I don't use Facebook and Twitter. I don't, I don't use Facebook and Twitter officially. And um, you can email me directly, but I also have um, other accounts and so forth. You can find me through the Journal of Health Communication or any of that. But with that, I know I hope I left a little bit of time if you want questions in the big session. I'm, I'm going to stay for a while to answer questions outside, as Linda mentioned. Yeah, so. Thank you.